It's good to see everyone this morning. I appreciate you being here very much. Hope everyone is doing well. Uh, appreciated Bruce's comments during the announcements, being thankful that I am still healthy. Bruce, please don't jinx me. <laughs> um, but appreciate the prayers for, for the kids and Jennifer as they um, are getting over various illnesses. From the scripture reading there in Daniel chapter 1, and I hope you're still turning there, it was, it was one of the darkest times in Israel's history. It was the time of the captivity. And I was just thinking about that time. It has been said there are few words in the English language that are more beautiful than the word home. And we appreciate home. Um, gone for the gospel meeting for the week a couple of weeks ago. And as much as I enjoyed being there, it was nice to come home. And it's always nice to go where mom and dad are and to think about home as well. Um, from growing up there and things along those lines. You know, as, as I'm sure you've seen videos and pictures of what's happening down south right now with the hurricane, and so many people have lost their homes, and you see, you see what's happening, and it's just devastating. I want you to think about Daniel and think about the time of the captivity. Because there in, in Daniel chapter 1, where we read, as it talks about Jerusalem had been besieged in the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand. And Jerusalem was destroyed. How would you... You know, in, in perhaps some of y'all's lifetimes, you know, to think back to the early 1940s and think about Pearl Harbor and think about how, how devastating that was, that all of a sudden someone from another country set foot on our soil and started killing people. Just, just think about that idea. And that was, of course, those islands in the Pacific. And, of course, it was the time of war. But now imagine if someone were to come to this country, destroy our capital, and actually take us back to their country. And think about how horrible that would be, because that is, that is the situation with Israel. That Jerusalem had been besieged, and it was all God's doing. It was all God's doing that God gave, as it says, the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand, into Nebuchadnezzar's hand, with some of the articles of the house of God which he carried into the land of Shinar. If you've ever heard that, that name Shinar before, back in Genesis chapter 11, Shinar was the place where they started making bricks. They start making bricks and they're building this tower up into the heavens, it says. And the Lord looks at them and says, and frankly rebukes them and comes down and scatters them across scatters them across the land. And the name of that place was Shinar, but from that time it came to be called Babel. Babylon. It's the same place. And so Daniel and the captives have been brought into the land of Shinar. And so here, Babylon. And it's just an amazing, an amazing account. What we are going to speak about this morning, we're, we're going to think about Daniel and the kings for, the, for this lesson and probably for the next two lessons as well, because Daniel actually crosses kingdoms. Daniel serves unto numerous kings. Daniel serves under Nebuchadnezzar. Daniel serves under Belshazzar, or he's, I should say he's promoted at the end of Belshazzar's reign. We'll talk about that next week. And then he's also under Darius, and then Daniel's also under Cyrus. Now, if you hear Cyrus, you should think the end of captivity because that's going to happen in Cyrus's time. But for this morning, we're going to look in Nebuch at the account of Nebuchadnezzar and those years. We have more about that account than some of the others I would suggest. But I'd like to look at the account and think about a few different applications we can make for Daniel and his friends as we serve the same Lord. And so to go ahead and get into it from the scripture reading, 
we read about the delicacies and what happened from the scripture reading there in chapter there in chapter one the king, the king instructed verse three the master of the eunuchs to bring some of the children of Israel and some of the king's descendants some of the nobles young men there's no blemish right they were handsome they're good looking they're gifted in all wisdom and what they do is they're trying to strip they're trying to strip their culture away from them. They're trying to strip who they are away. And so they give them new names. All right, so verse 7, To them the chief of the eunuch gave names. He gave Daniel the name Belteshazzar, to Hananiah Shadrach, to Mishael Meshach, and to Azariah Abednego. And so they, they do these things. Verse 4 again, Whom they might teach the language and literature of the Chaldeans. So they give them Chaldean names. They give them Babylonian names. They want them to speak the, the language, the, the native language of the Babylonians. You might think about that. And the literature of the Chaldeans. So they're trying to strip away their identity. That's what they're trying to do. And, of course, we know what Daniel does. He purposed in his heart. Verse 8. But Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's delicacies, nor with the wine which he drank. Uh, therefore he requested of the chief of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. He wasn't going to eat unclean foods. While they were trying to strip away their identity, their Jewish identity, Daniel and these three individuals, they purpose in their hearts that they may retain that identity and be holy unto God is what's happening. And so in the remainder of the account, the chief of the eunuchs says, you're going to get me in trouble, to paraphrase it so we won't read the whole thing. The chief of the eunuchs says, you're going to get me in trouble. And Daniel says, test us, find out. And so they're not going to eat the king's delicacies. They're not going to eat the unclean meats. They're not going to drink the wine. And they say, we're only going to eat vegetables to eat and water to drink. Verse 12, test your servants for 10 days. Let, give us these things, vegetables in the water, and then come back after that set amount of time and see, see if we are becoming emaciated or see if whether we're actually healthier. And lo and behold, the unit comes back and guess what? They're actually healthier. And so the unit says, okay, this should be fine and allows them to eat vegetables and water. And so as we think about the account, and then they, they're going to have their training, and the king interviews them, verse 19, and all these things, verse 20, and, and in all matters of wisdom and understanding about which the king examined them, he found them ten times better than all the mag magicians, astrologers, who are in all his realm. And then we have verse 21, thus Daniel continued until the time of Cyrus. That's, that's still three or four kings away is where Daniel's going to be. But in thinking about this account, as we begin with Daniel and his three friends, what I wanted you to consider is what could they have said? What could Daniel and those friends have said when they are offered the king's delicacies, when they're commanded, right? This is your portion, the king's delicacies, the king's wine. I want you to think about what excuses they could have said, what excuses they could have used to partake of those things. Okay? One of the things they could have said, they could have said, it's just youthful wild oats, right? And what this speaks to is justifying sin. And sometimes when people are younger, and, and just this phrase, this phrase is a part of the English language. Oh, well, they're just sowing their wild oats. And it's, you know, we need to remember what Solomon said. Remember your creator in the days of your youth. And that's what Daniel and his three friends are doing. They're remembering their creator in the days of their youth. Yes, they're in a far off land. They're in a strange land. But just because they're young is no excuse. But they could have said that. They could have said, ah, we're just, we're young. You know, we got our whole lives in front of us. And so some people excuse away sin with that. Ah, it's just youthful wild oats. It's a mistake. They could have said, you know, God has given up on us. Because God had given them into the hand of Nebuchadnezzar. And so it would have been very tempting for those individuals to say, you know what? I think we ought to eat the king's delicacies. I think we ought to eat the king's portions. I think we ought to drink the wine. 
I think we ought to do those things because obviously, I think, and basically what they could have said is, we're going to give up on God because God's given up on us. Well, God had not given up on them. Now God's disciplining them, but it's what they could have said. They're in a far off land. They're in a strange land. They're not in Jerusalem. They're not in Israel. They're in Babylon. By God's doing, they're in Babylon. So they could have said, God's given up on us. Now, as an application, we find ourselves in difficult situations. And sometimes it would be very easy to say, I think God's given up on me, and so I'll just give up on God. And it would be a mistake. It would be a mistake. God allows us to go through trials and tribulations knowing the good that can come from them. So we have to remember that in those difficult times. The men also could have said, you know, everyone else is doing it. I don't know how many captives there were. It may say at a certain point in Scripture, I'm just not familiar with it. But all that's singled out here are Daniel and his three friends. Well, I would assume, based on verses 3 and 4, I would assume that those were not the only ones there. Right there in verse 4 when it says, Young men in whom there is no blemish. You might notice verse 6, Now from among those of the sons of Judah were these just these few. I'm going to assume there is more than three or four there. I think that's a pretty good assumption. I don't know what they're doing. I don't know what, what everyone else is doing. It may be that, that the others are partaking of the delicacies and drinking the wine. I don't know. And so these individuals, they could have said, well, everyone else is doing it. Why not us? And of course, we can do the same thing. We can look around and see what people are doing. Sometimes we can even look within the church and see what brethren are doing and think that it's okay just because brethren are doing it. Just because someone's doing something, just because brethren may be doing it, that doesn't necessarily make it okay. No, we have to purpose in our heart to serve the Lord. And that's what these individuals did. They didn't have to, but they did. But these are some of the excuses they could have used. They could have said, what's the harm? It's just food. <laughs> right? That's all we're talking about. It's just food. They, they are not yet, they are not being, they are not yet being asked to bow down to an idol. We'll get there eventually. But this is just food. This is just certain meats, whatever it is, the king's delicacies, and the wine. They could have said, what's the big deal? I mean, this is, this is small stuff. This is, it's just food. We have to be careful with that mentality as well. Um, we know what the devil's looking for. The devil's just looking for a foothold. The devil's looking for a small opening. And so when we look at things and we say, ah, that, that's just a, that's a tiny issue. Well, that may be the very issue. That's the very place the devil's looking for to get into our lives. And so you might think about that idea. They could have said, what's the harm? They could have said, you know, it is an order. <laughs> and that's where... That's where you start having a recurring theme throughout Daniel, and we'll talk more about it here in a second. But they could have said, we've been told to do this. And that gets into, that gets into an area where we better be real steadfast. Because what's happening now is they're not in Israel. They're not in Jerusalem. They're in a foreign country. And when the king gives an order in the foreign country, what should you do? Right? Right? And so this speaks to respecting authority. But when it comes to respecting authority, the question is what happens when man's law conflicts with God's law? And we have to say, should we listen to man or to God? But what a lot of people will do, a lot of people will say, well, it's an order and I got to do it. A lot of people say it's man's law, it has to be. Not if it conflicts with God's law. But that's what they could have said. They could have said any one of those things on the screen. And they didn't. They did not use any of those things as an excuse. They purposed Daniel and these other individuals, Daniel specifically spoken about, he purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's delicacies, nor with the wine which he drank. And therefore he spoke to the chief of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. He steps out and he asks for this. 
and the Lord is with them. And I'll, I'll say that as well. The Lord was with them. If you eat, you eat nothing but vegetables and water after 10 days, what are you going to look like? <laughs> right? They, they understood these things. What the, what the king is wanting them to do is to fill themselves, frankly, with protein. Right? In an effort to plump them up. Protein builds muscle. All right? To make them more healthy. So the king is saying, that's what the king wants. And so Daniel, when he says, let us just drink vegetables and water, and then come and examine, and after 10 days, verse 15, their features appeared better and fatter in flesh. All right? This is not dietary advice if you want to add. <laughs> this is not dietary advice. My point is, the Lord was with them. This was an unnatural thing. But the Lord was with them, and they appeared healthier. And, verse 15, they appeared better and fatter in flesh. They could have used any of these excuses, and they did. Even though they're young, even though they're in a strange land, even though they've given the order, even though their brethren may have been doing these things, they didn't use any of those excuses. They purposed in their heart to follow the Lord. Now we need to think about the king's dreams. So, come over to chapter 2, in Daniel chapter 2. Let's read the first six verses. It says, Now, in the second year of Nebuchadnezzar's reign, Nebuchadnezzar had dreams, and his spirit was troubled, was so troubled that his sleep left him. And then the king gave the command to call the magicians and the astrologers, the sorcerers and the Chaldeans, tell the king dream, tell his dreams. So they came and stood before the king. And the king said to them, I've had a dream, and my spirit is anxious to know the dream. Then the Chaldeans spoke to the king in Aramaic, O king, live forever, tell your servants the dream, and we will give the interpretation. The king answered and said to the Chaldeans, My decision is firm. If you do not make known to me the dream, make known the dream to me and its interpretation, you shall be cut in pieces, and your houses shall be made an ash heap. However, if you tell the dream and its interpretation, you shall receive from me gifts, rewards, and great honor, and therefore tell me the dream and its interpretation. They answered again and said, Let the king tell his servants the dream, and we will give its interpretation. Right? So the king says, If you guys really know what you're talking about, tell me my dream, and then tell me the interpretation. And of course, the astrologers and all of them say, that's really hard to do, actually. Nobody really can do that. So if you could tell us the dream, then we'll give you the interpretation. As a parallel, you might just think about it. You don't see them around here too much, but I assume they exist. Um, people go to psychics anymore, right? And they go to the psychics. And what do the psychics say when they come in? How can I help you today? Well, if you're really a psychic, don't you know why I'm here already? See, that's the problem with that question. And so these folks, this, that's the king's argument. If you guys really are what you say you are, tell me my dream and then give me the interpretation. They can't do it. So then guess what happens? The order is given and they're going to start killing all those wise men. Daniel gets wind of it and Daniel asks for time that he might tell the king the interpretation. So in the account... And Daniel gives the interpretation. The Lord reveals to Daniel what it is. And the dream is there's an image. And in the image, and to just read a little bit, because there's going to be two dreams. Look over in verse 32. The image's head was of fine gold, its chest and arms of silver, its belly and thighs of bronze, its legs of iron, its feet partly of iron, partly of clay. And, while, and you watched while a stone was cut out without hands, which struck the image on its feet of iron and clay and broke them in pieces. Verse 36, this is the dream. And now we will tell you the interpretation of it before the king. 
O king, you are king of kings, for the God of heaven has given you a kingdom, power, strength, and glory. And wherever the children of men dwell, or the beasts of the field and the birds of the heaven, he has given them into your hand and has made you ruler over them all. You are this head of gold. But after you shall rise another kingdom, inferior to yours, and then another, a third kingdom, a bronze, which shall rule over all the earth, and the fourth kingdom, which shall be as strong as iron. And so you start having all of these kingdoms. And what you have is you're going to be going from the Babylonians and you're going to be going to the Medes and the Persians and you're eventually going to be going to Greece, the Greeks and Alexander the Great, and eventually you're going to be going to the Roman Empire. And in the days of the Roman Empire, something special is going to happen. We'll talk more about that as we go along. But this is what you have, and so you have this interpretation. And, and when Daniel says... The Lord has done all this. He's given this into your hand. But after you, there's going to rise another king. And guess who that's going to be? That's Belshazzar. That's going to be next week's lesson. But then you have the second dream. The second dream is in chapter 4. And after certain things happen, after, namely the fiery furnace, chapter 4, Nebuchadnezzar has another dream. In this dream, there's an image of a tree. So in chapter 4, at verse 10, and by the way, this is Nebuchadnezzar writing this now. Chapter 4, verse 10, it says, These were the visions of my head while on my bed. I was looking, and behold, a tree in the midst of the earth, and its height was great. The tree grew and became strong. Its height reached to the heavens. It could be seen to the ends of all the earth. Its leaves were lovely, its fruit abundant, and in it was food for all the beasts of the field around found shade and pardon me, the beasts of the field found shade under it. The birds of the heavens dwelt in its branches, and all flesh was fed from it. I saw in the visions of my head while on my bed there was a watcher, a holy one coming down from heaven. He cried aloud and said thus, Chop down the tree, cut off its branches, strip off its leaves and scatter its fruit. Let the beasts get out from under it and the birds from its branches. Nevertheless, leave the stump and roots in the earth, bound with a band of iron and bronze and the tender grass of the field. Let it be wet with, dew of hev with the dew of heaven and let him graze with the beasts on the grass of the earth. Let his heart be changed from that of a man. Let him be given the heart of a beast and, and let seven times pass over him. You have the tree. Nebuchadnezzar's the tree. And so the watcher comes and says, cut it down. And then you have this vision, and we know what's going to end up happening with Nebuchadnezzar. He is going to become a wild man. His sense, just as it says, just as it says, let him graze with the beasts on the grass of the earth. That's what's going to end up being spoken about at the end of chapter 4. And so, as... All this was happening, and you think about these visions and being revealed. Well, we'll simply say this. One of the things we see within Daniel's life, there would have been a, a great temptation in interpreting certain, these dreams when Daniel did that to not tell the truth. This is sort of like when Joseph was in the dungeon, and you had these two, right? You had the baker and you had the butler, and there's two dreams, <laughs> And in one person's dream, all of a sudden, he, he regains his position. And then the other fellow says, oh, interpret my dream. And it's not good news. <laughs> and he's about to die. So these dreams and these visions are being revealed, and Nebuchadnezzar needs an interpretation. It would have been very tempting for Daniel to not tell the truth. It would have been very tempting for Daniel to say, you know what? Your kingdom's going to last forever. Your kingdom's going to last forever, and the kingdom of your son, it's going to last forever. And everything's going to be good. Everything's going to be good. It would have been very tempting to say that. But Daniel simply tells the truth. And as all these things are happening, here it's being revealed to Nebuchadnezzar. You might look at verse, this is chapter 4, at verse 28. All this came upon King Nebuchadnezzar. At the end of 12 months, he's walking about the royal palace of Babylon. 
And the king spoke, saying, Is not this great Babylon that I have built for a royal dwelling by my mighty power and for the honor of my majesty? And while the word was still in the king's mouth, a voice fell from heaven. King Nebuchadnezzar, to you it is spoken, the kingdom has departed from you, and they shall drive you from men, and your dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field. They shall make you eat grass like oxen, and seven times shall pass over you. Most commentators, they think that seven times, that is not seven days, that is not seven weeks, they think that's seven years. Just because of how he's described. It says, until you know that the Most High rules in the kingdoms of men and gives it to whomever he chooses, that very hour the word was fulfilled concerning Nebuchadnezzar. He was driven from men and ate grass like oxen. His body was wet with the dew of heaven till his hair had grown like eagle's feathers. That doesn't happen in a few days. His hair had grown like eagle's feathers and his nails like bird's claws. So most scholars think that that was seven years. At the end of that time, Nebuchadnezzar lifted his eyes to heaven. Verse 34, his understanding returned to him. He blessed the Most High and praised and honored him who lives forever. For his dominion is an everlasting dominion, speaking of God's dominion. His kingdom is from generation to generation. All the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing. He does according to his will in the army of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth. No one can restrain his hand or say to him, what have you done? At the same time, my reason returned to me, and for the glory of my kingdom, my honor and splendor returned to me. My counselors and nobles resorted to me. I was restored to my kingdom, and excellent majesty was added to me. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and extol and honor the king of heaven, all of whose works are truth and his ways justice, and those who walk in pride he is able to put down. To think about the visions and the dreams that were given and the understanding of those things. It would have been so tempting to conceal the truth. But when we think about the truth, what is the point of the truth? We know what the Lord says, you shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. But the thing is, God always resists the proud. He gives grace to the humble. And so another, I think another purpose of the truth is to humble us. And so Daniel, in that first dream especially, Daniel could have concealed the truth. But he says, listen, the Lord has done this. The Lord has done this and other kingdoms are coming. Now this is the part you're playing in. it. Now eventually there's going to be a kingdom established that will never fall. And we know what that kingdom is going to be. That, those words were said to Nebuchadnezzar. Now, if you're Nebuchadnezzar at that point, what should you be looking for? I want that kingdom. I should have, I should have put a picture in the PowerPoint for today. In, there, there's a museum in Germany. It's called the, the Pergamum Museum, actually. And in the Pergamum Museum, they've actually they have excavated the gates of Babylon. And they have reconstructed them in that museum. If you have a chance this afternoon, pull that up. And it's just this huge gate made from blue stones lined with these figures of these animals. Lions and giraffes and all manner of beasts. And it's through those gates that Nebuchadnezzar would have walked. We know of the of the wonders of the ancient world. We know what one of those wonders was. It was the hanging gardens of Babylon. And there Nebuchadnezzar is, and he says, look at all that I've done. <laughs> look at all that I've built. And the Lord says, effectively, it's just like in the New Testament and the foolish farmer. You fool, this night, this is what's going to happen. And I, I was wondering this week about, it says they drove him. They drove him out. And so I wonder if what happened is this. I wonder if that he did not lose his senses and start acting like an animal in the palace and they had to drive him out. They had to drive him out because he had lost his senses because the Lord took it away from him. But in all these things, we have the truth. We have the visions revealed 
and we have Daniel in that first dream, he could have very easily concealed the truth, and he doesn't. The truth humbles us. Here, here's the, to think about this idea. Do you know who's going to win the election in November? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. Um, I don't know. I don't even know if we're still going to be here in November. I don't know when the Lord's going to return. Can you imagine being a Christian back in the 1750s? 1750s and 1760s. And who's the ruling government? Uh-oh, we're before our independence, aren't we? And here's my point. Kingdoms rise and kingdoms fall. Who in the world ever said that America is going to last forever? No one ever said that. There's no prophecy about that. God rules in the kingdoms of men. Whether they rise or fall, this is one of the themes of Daniel. Daniel was faithful to God across the kingdoms. It did not matter who the king was. And, and so here as you have these dreams, the truth humbles us. America, I, America is not God's kingdom. The church is God's kingdom. That's the truth. And the truth should humble us. We are thankful for the country we live in, and we're not trying to denigrate the country. That's not what we're trying to do. And that's also one of the things that you see in Daniel. Daniel speaks to pagan kings, and he says, O king, live forever. He was respectful to those kings. And as much as it did not conflict with God's law, he submitted to those kings. And he served those kings regardless of king and regardless of kingdom. But in all things, he was looking to God. And he was looking towards, frankly, the coming Messiah. And so that truth should humble us. That truth should humble us. That the country we live in, while we are thankful for it, and while we pray for those that are in authority, the truth is that our citizenship is in heaven. And so we look, we set our minds on things above and not on things below. And doesn't mean that we put our head in the sand concerning things happening around us. Doesn't mean that we're not concerned about elections and things like that, whatever the case. But the truth humbles us. And we recognize our place in everything, and we recognize God's place in everything. So we might think about the truth and not concealing the truth as well. We need to speak about the fiery furnace. In, in chapter 3, in between the two dreams, the two visions, you have, of course, the account of Daniel's three friends disobeying the king because an image has been made. In Daniel chapter 3, of verse 1, Nebuchadnezzar, the king, made an image of gold whose height was 60 cubits and its width, uh, pardon me, its height was 60 cubits, its width 6 cubits. He set it up in the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. And so at the unveiling of this image, as the music is played, the, the law is going to be written. The command is going to be that every knee has to bow to the image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up, verse 7. And so at that time, verse 8, certain Chaldeans came forward and accused the Jews and spoke to King Nebuchadnezzar, verse 9, O king, live forever. And they tell them about these individuals who will not bow the knee. Verse 12, There are certain Jews whom you have set over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These men, O king, have not paid due, re due regard to you. They do not serve your gods or worship the gold image which you set up. And Nebuchadnezzar, in a rage and a fury, gave the command to bring those three individuals. And so they brought them, and Nebuchadnezzar says in verse 14, Is it true that you do not serve my gods or worship the gold image which I've set up? If you're ready at the time, verse 15, when you hear the music, he says, bow the knee. Right? When you hear the music and you see that image which I have made, bow the knee. But if you do not worship, you shall be cast immediately into the midst of the burning fiery furnace. And who is the God who will deliver you from my hands? 
Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. If that is the case, our God whom we serve is able to serve, is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace, and he will deliver us from your hand, O king. But if not, let it be known to you, O king, that we do not serve your gods, nor will we worship the gold image which you have set up. They say, our God is able to deliver us, but if he allows us to perish in that fire, so be it, we're not bowing the knee. We're not obeying that command. And so what they do is they respectfully defy the king. And that is the recurring theme throughout Daniel. They respectfully defy the king. You might consider it. Um, the furnace was prepared. They're thrown in. They actually heated the furnace seven times more than it was usually heated in verse 19. The command was given. Certain mighty men of valor who were in the army, they were to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and cast them into the furnace. These men were bound in their coats and their trousers and their turbans and other, their other ornaments, and they were cast, pardon me, other garments, and were cast into the midst of the burning fiery furnace. And therefore, because the king's command was urgent and the furnace exceedingly hot, the flame of the fire killed those men who took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell down, bound into the midst of the burning fiery furnace. And then King Nebuchadnezzar was astonished. And he rose in haste and spoke, saying to his counselors, Did we not cast three men bound into the midst of the fire? They answered and said to the king, True, O king. Look, he answered, I see four men loose, walking in the midst of the fire, and they are not hurt. And the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. Then Nebuchadnezzar went near the mouth of the burning fiery furnace and spoke, saying, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, servants of the Most High God, come out and come here. And then Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came from the midst of the fire. And the satraps, administrators, governors, and the king's counselors gathered together, and they saw these men on whose bodies the fire had no power. The hair of their head was not singed, nor were their garments affected, and the smell of fire was not on them. Nebuchadnezzar spoke, saying, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who sent his angel and delivered his servants who trusted in him. And they have frustrated the king's word and yielded their bodies that they should not serve nor worship any god except their own god. Therefore I make a decree that any people, nation, or language which speaks anything amiss against the god of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego shall be cut in pieces, and their houses shall be made an ash heap because there is no other God who, who can deliver like this. And then the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the province of Babylon, and then we have the second vision. Just an amazing account, and we simply say this. Is there a way and a time and a place to be defiant? There's a way and a time and a place. And that's one of the things we learn from the account. And we simply say what those individuals said, what those three men said. If we die, we die. That's fine. If we die, we die. Our God is able to deliver us, but if He allows us to perish, so be it. We're not bowing down to that God. We're not doing it. There is, needless to say, idolatry is still prevalent today. It just looks different. Covetousness is idolatry. I think politics can be idolatry. I think sports can be idolatry. I think family can be idolatry. And we simply say we're not going to bow down to that God. We bow down to the Lord. We bow down to Jehovah. Here as we think about the fiery furnace, it's just an amazing account. And I understand why children love it so much. You know, if you've ever... You probably have even just, here, here in two or three months, how many people are going to burn fires in their fireplace? You know, and there you are, and you're just enjoying the fire, and you go someplace else, and you smell, and what do you smell like? 
you smell like smoke. Sit around a campfire, and after about a minute, what do you smell like? You smell like a campfire. And here these men are, and they come out. Their hair's not hinged, and you don't even smell smoke on them. And Nebuchadnezzar had looked in and said, I thought there was only three guys in there. I see a fourth one, and he looks like the Son of God. And I understand he didn't understand what he was seeing. Was, could have been an angel, I believe, anyway. Whatever the case, there was a fourth individual there. And we simply say that the Lord was with them. The Lord was with them, but there's a time, a time and a place and a way to be defiant. And that's what those three individuals were. And that's what Daniel was at the beginning. They purposed in their heart not to defile themselves. Now, remember that verse back in chapter 1. Thus Daniel continued until the first year of King Cyrus. After the fiery furnace, you would like to think that Nebuchadnezzar, you would like to think that Nebuchadnezzar would have humbled himself. But you know, th this is sort of like Egypt. And you have, you have the plagues on Egypt, and those plagues corresponded to individual gods that Egypt worshipped. There was a god of the Nile, there was the god of the sun, there was all these various gods. But then the tenth plague was what? The tenth plague is on the firstborn. Because one of those gods was Pharaoh himself. And so here Nebuchadnezzar is in the book of Daniel, and he sees in the account of these three individuals, and he sees someone there. And you can tell, and just think about the language he uses in that account, when Nebuchadnezzar says, I make a decree that any people, nation, or language which speaks anything amiss against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, against their God. Here's an idea. Why don't you make their God your God? <laughs> That's what should have happened. But Nebuchadnezzar, however much time passes later, he's lifted up with pride. He's lifted up with pride, and he says what he says. Is not this great Babylon that I have built for a royal dwelling by my mighty power and for the honor of my majesty? He's worshiping himself. And then he turns into a wild animal. It's an interesting account. Daniel continues until the first year of Cyrus. He crosses kings and kingdoms. What Daniel is looking for, if, you, if you're familiar with Daniel, he's waiting for the end of captivity. He wants to know when captivity is going to end. And so as you think about the 70-year captivity, and he's looking forward to that time, and he's looking forward to the time when there's going to be another kingdom. And we're going to use that verse talking about that other kingdom as an invitation. In chapter 2, come back where we left off. In that first dream... And you have this image. But remember, in that image, and you have all of these body parts made from different, different things, whether it's clay or silver or gold or iron. But in the middle, in the middle, you have, as it speaks about, a stone that was cut out, spoken about. Stone was cut out without hands, verse 34. Come down to verse 39 and read the remainder of the interpretation of that dream says, you, O king, pardon me, verse 39, but after you shall arise another kingdom inferior to yours, and then another, a third kingdom of bronze, which shall rule, rule over all the earth. And the fourth kingdom shall be as strong as iron, inasmuch as iron breaks in pieces and shatters everything. And like iron that crushes, that kingdom will break in pieces and crush all the others. Whereas you saw the feet and toes partly of potter's clay and partly of iron, the kingdom shall be divided, yet the strength of the iron shall be in it, just as you saw the iron mixed with ceramic clay. And as the toes of the feet were partly of iron and partly of clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly fragile. As you saw iron mixed with ceramic clay, they will mingle with the seed of men, but they will not adhere to one another, just as iron does not mix with clay. And in the days of these kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed, and the kingdom shall not be left to other people. 
It shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. Inasmuch as you saw that the stone was cut out of the mountain without hands, and that it broke in pieces the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold, the great God has made known to the king what will come to pass after this. The dream is certain, and its interpretation is sure. To think about these things, you have Babylon. Then you have the Medes and the Persians. Then you have the Greeks and Alexander the Great. And Alexander wept for there were no more worlds to conquer. I can't remember exactly how old Alexander was when he died, but he was a young man. And you know what Alexander did not have? He did not have an heir. So this great Greek kingdom is divided amongst those in his army, if I remember correctly, different families or whatever it is. And so it's weakened. And then Rome comes in. And in the, in the days of the Roman kingdom, another kingdom is going to be established. And that's what Jesus says. That's what Daniel says here, and that's what the Lord said. The Lord said, there were some standing there who would not taste death till they saw the kingdom of um, with power. Well, what did they see? They saw the church. Where does the kingdom reside? The kingdom resides within man. How do you stop that kingdom then? How do you stop that kingdom? You don't. Not as long as people follow the Lord. Not as long as people follow the Lord. What do we have to do as we offer the invitation? We have to do what these individuals did. They purposed in their heart to follow God. That's what we have to do. The other thing we have to do is we have to speak truth. And it can be hard to speak truth with friends and family and neighbors and brethren. Sometimes it is very hard to tell the truth because the truth hurts. The truth hurts. But it's the truth. And it should humble us. And then what we do is we draw, we, what we do in all these things is we draw near to God. That's what Daniel's three friends did. They drew near to God, and what did God do to them in the fiery furnace? Draw near to God, and He will draw near unto you. So if you're here this morning, if you're not a Christian, if you're not a Christian, put on Christ in baptism. Turn from your sins, confess that, yes, He is the Son of God, and be baptized for the remission of your sins. If you're not a Christian, if you're not a Christian, be baptized into Christ. Unless we repent, we will all likewise perish. That's the Lord's truth. He who believes and is baptized will be saved. Draw near unto the Lord, and He will draw near unto you. Now here's the thing. Not to make it political again. <laughs> I don't know who's going to win the election in November, like I said. But I know who's already serving as Lord in Christ. I know God is on His throne. And I know the commands that He has given. And so we follow the Lord. We follow the Lord regardless, regardless of who our earthly leader may be. We follow the Lord. Very simple. The lesson is yours. If you're here this morning and need to respond to the invitation and becoming a Christian, if you are a Christian but you have need of prayers, for any reason, if there's any way we can help, please come this morning while we stand and sing today.